Our sermon series is PBNJ, and this morning's first Sabbath series uh, sermon is called Baby Talk. Um, you may not know why a woman from the Caribbean would be out uh, this past Thursday evening with her two daughters and her loving, caring husband. Uh, this is our front yard, and we're gathering grass. Anyone know why? If you're from South America, the Caribbean, you probably have, if you still remember this, um, in our culture, we celebrate Christmas, but we also celebrate what is called Three Kings Day, which is January 6th. And the way the celebration goes is uh, the, on January 5th, you have to go outside and get some grass and put it in a little box and get some water and put it somewhere in your house. And the, the, the story is this, that on January 6th, the kings, the wise men who are going to see Jesus are on their way to see Jesus, and they'll need a place to rest. So if you leave some grass and water, they will stop at your house, feed the camels with that grass, and give that water to drink to their camels, and in exchange for that kindness, they'll give you, leave you behind some gifts. So it's a great incentive, you know, in South America, it's a great incentive for cutting the grass, mowing the lawn. Um, you get a big pile of grass, then, you, of course, you, you probably will get a lot of gifts back from the kings. But in Michigan, it's hard to find grass <laughs> January 5th. But praise the Lord, some of it had thought out, and here's Gianna uh, and my wife, and we wanted Anaya to start having that experience, get, getting some grass. And this is Gianna, uh, Friday morning, re realizing that that Christmas tree had been replenished. The, it wasn't Santa this time, it was the three kings that came. And so kids, take notes. You want double gifts this coming year? Tell your parents. We're picking up some grass January 5th. Uh, so mom and dad, get ready with that credit card. <laughs> More gifts. Um, Gianna was happy, excited. And one of the, the gifts that Dalina and I got her is this book. It's a very special book. It's very meaningful for the both of them. We didn't give it to Gianna or Anaya, it's, it's a book for both of them. Even though Anaya can't read right now, this book is part of her story, it's part of her journey, because this book is called, can you read that, those words, the title of the book? What is the title? Prayer Works. Prayer Works. And the reason we got this book is this journey with our little girls began when I was in Lebanon uh, over a year ago. I had been invited to do a week of prayer at our Middle East University there. And while I was there, I shared with my former senior pastor, uh, Larry Lichtenwalter, uh, the burden that Delina and I had for our little girl. I was already thinking a couple of years in the future, we will be moved to a new church and all the friends that Gianna has here, she'll have to start again from scratch. And she doesn't have a, a consistent friend. And... That was a burden in our hearts. We were at the point of starting to look at adoption agencies. And while I was gone, Dalina and Gianna had a conversation in the kitchen. And Gianna said, Mommy, let's pray. I, I want to ask God for a sister. And so they got on their knees in the kitchen, in our kitchen, and they prayed. I got home from Lebanon. And my wife um, and I, we had been praying and when we got to Puerto Rico for a vacation that year, on December 25th, my wife gave me a big bag with a pregnancy test that said positive. And uh, it just blew me away. Uh, I was quite uh, wondering why is she waking me up at 5 in the morning, December 25th, with a, crisp, with a Christmas bag. I'll open it later. She's like, no, 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 no. You have to see this now. And so in the quietness of the bathroom, I had to hold back my screaming and yelling of celebration. And then nine months later, the sister that prayed gets to read the book with the sister she prayed for. And the title of the book is Prayer, Prayer, Prayer Works, Prayer Works. I want to start off this sermon series not with a whole bunch of instructions and, and, and ABCs type things. Um, I want to start with what is prayer really? 
I've kept, the, I kept this book for over a decade. When I was in nursing school, I had to take a sociology class, and there's a lot of good things in here, but there's one article, one story that has kept me from selling it or getting rid of it. And I'm, I'm going to read to you a, an article from this book. It's a secular book. Um, I went to a, a secular school for nursing. And this is the amazing thing, that in this book I found this. On page 368 of that book, um, Essential of Sociology by James Henslin, has this title. It says, Does Prayer Work? An Intriguing Experiment. This is what the article said. Seldom does social research make headlines, but this research did. The researchers, headed by the chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Columbia University, were so out, out, astounded by their finding that at first, they didn't know what to do with them. They didn't even want to report the results for fear that their scientific colleagues would laugh at or ridicule them. Their research is so scientifically solid, however, and the results so unambiguous that they decided that the only thing they could do was to publish their findings. What was it that so astounded the chairman and the whole Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Columbia University? Cha General Hospital in Seoul, South Korea, this hospital offered treatments for women who wanted to get pregnant but couldn't. One of the physicians suggested that prayer might make a difference for these women. The medical researchers knew that prayer could not possibly make a difference, but since they had nothing to lose, they went ahead with the experiment fully expecting that prayer would make how much difference? No difference. Background information was gathered on the 219 patients a statistician in Korea who did not know the purpose of the research gathered this information and sent it to another statistician in the U.S. who also did not know the purpose of the experiment. In this exchange, 20 patients were lost due to fragmentary email transmissions, so only 199 women were left. They were matched by age, reason for infertility, and length of infertility. Then a computer randomly assigned the women to be part of the experimental group, those women who would be prayed for, and the control group, those women who would not receive prayer. The U.S. statisticians sent photographs, just the photographs of the women who were prayed for to members of Christian denominations in the U.S., Canada, and Australia. Only the photograph was sent. No names, no data, nothing else. These churches were instructed, here is a photograph of this individual. Please pray for this individual. For what? Never mind. Just pray for this individual. That was it. One group prayed for the women. A second group prayed that the prayers of the first group would be effective. And a third group prayed for the first two groups. Sounds like a church, right? They prayed for three weeks. What did they find? This was a double-blind experiment. The women did not know that they were being prayed for, even to this day, to eliminate the placebo effect. The medical staff caring for these women did not know about the experiment. All women received identical in vitro fertilization embryo transfer. The researchers do not work for a religious organization, nor was the study funded by one. And the results? The women who were prayed for were twice as likely to get pregnant. And for Columbia University, this metric was significant enough that it needed to be published under the title, Thus Prayer Work. Scientifically, they can't explain how this specific group that did not know they were being prayed for, the medical staff that were caring for them did not know that they were being prayed for, no one knew that these women were being prayed for. The churches in the United States, Canada, and Australia did not know what they were praying for, just a photograph. Just a photograph. I believe God allows for these things to happen because he knows that when people say or share testimonies as 
my daughter prayed and we got pregnant, someone probably may be thinking, well, pastor, I know of people that prayed and they did not get pregnant. I know of individuals that have prayed for healing and they died with the illness. So how can we say prayer works in a definitive, conclusive, conclusive all the time prayer works? Wouldn't it be a more accurate statement to say prayer sometimes works? I mean, pastor, look at the study. Uh, twice as likely. It doesn't mean that every woman that was prayed for got pregnant. This is what we need to begin grappling with. Because prayer does work. It's what prayer does that we sometimes miss the point. What does prayer do? Prayer does something, but what does it do, Pastor? How does it do this and why? These are some of the questions that we'll be grappling with through this series and more. Let's begin this sermon series taking baby steps. Or better yet, baby talk. The sermon title is Baby Talk Under the Canopy of PBNJ. This is Anaya. Ew. She's happy because I just stuffed her with milk and changed her diaper. And I talk to her. Daleen talks to her. Gianna talks to her. Babies will learn how to talk to the parents from the words the parents use with them. Pay attention to this section. It may seem rudimentary, but there's a purpose for this. Babies will learn their parents' language and vocabulary and use it in order to communicate back to their parents. The, the, the exchange of communication is initiated by the parents through words, by conversation. If you don't talk to your baby, your baby will never learn how to talk. And your babies will use the words and the vocabulary you use with them. Babies get and learn the words from the parents. But the words are not merely to ed educate and build a baby's vocabulary. There's a vital reason for the communication that develops between a baby and his or her parents. Within the context, listen carefully, within the context of a parent-child relationship, language and vocabulary serve primarily for the purpose of revealing and what else? Defining. Revealing and defining. Communication between a parent and a child reveals and defines. It reveals and defines the parent-child relationship to the baby. It reveals to the baby who the parents are, not vice versa. The parents know this is their baby, but the baby does not know these are his or her parents. And the parents' words will eventually and gradually reveal this relationship reality to the baby. My baby girl does not know that I am father to her. She does not know I am, that they have, she has a mother. Doesn't know she has a sister that prays for her. Our little girl right now is just starting to get acquainted with words. She can recognize the tone of our voice, but she can't recognize what we're saying to her. She will as she listens to our words. Words reveal and define relationship. Words become the foundation for communication, and in communication is the bedrock for relationship. If you remove the words, can you have communication? And if you do not have communication, can you have a relationship? This picture, if I'd say to this child, who is your daddy and who is your mommy, will that child be able to tell me who, their mom, who his mom and daddy are? Yes or no? Yes. But what is his definition of mother and father? Daddy, he's the one that tells me in a minute, I'm busy. Father, he is always staring somewhere else, even when I talk to him. Daddy, 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 wait a second, I'm almost done. Wait a second, I'm too busy. Can we do this later? Voc 
Words are essential to reveal and define, but these two are crucial. The words will reveal, yes, I have a father. That's my father right there because he's taught me to say, Daddy, you're Daddy. But then those words, or the lack of them, define what father means. It is not sufficient to know we have a heavenly father. There's a need of a definition of what that word means. And this is at the bedrock of communication. This relationship of father-son, this revelation and definition of this relationship is contingent upon communication, and communication is built upon words. This is, I think, what all of us want, right? We want face-to-face -face communication. We want our children to learn how to talk, not from an iPad, but from mother and father. Amen? Mom and dad, take the phone away. Take the phone away. Your child will learn your mother, but that revelation is not sufficient. You need to define what that means to them. And you need to define that mother and father is caring, nurturing, attentive, present. The Bible does this. In Matthew 6, 9, the Bible, Jesus, through words, says, In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father. But that is not enough. Our Father says, yes, we are being revealed that we are not alone in this universe. We are being revealed that we did not create ourselves. We are being revealed that we did not just happen to exist. We have a father, a creator, someone that has intentionally brought us here. Anaya does not know that Dalene and I intentionally worked to have her here. We put our parts, we did something because we wanted Anaya to be here. And Anaya is clueless about this. Because she still does not understand our words. She's learning that. She will learn that from our words. She will learn, I am father, this is mama, I am papa. But the, the, the developing and ongoing conversations and relationships onwards will reveal to her what does papa mean, what does mama mean. Mama does not mean the lady in the kitchen cooking. Papa does not mean the man in the kitchen doing dishes. That's not papa, that's not mama. And when Jesus says, pray in this way, our father, that reveals the relationship. But Jesus defines it also for us in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33, we read these words. At, right after Jesus says, therefore pray in this manner, our father Jesus continues by saying, therefore I say to you, do not do what, church? Do not worry. Do not worry about your life. Look at the birds of the air. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he, your father, not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of your Father and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Jesus does not simply reveal, hey, you have a heavenly father. Jesus defines who God the Father is. And this revelation, and this is the, the, the thrust of this initial sermon this morning. This revelation that we have a father, and this revelation of who this father is, comes exclusively through the words of this book. You remove the words, can you have communication? And if you do not have communication, can you have a relationship? So, the enemy, when he wants to sabotage your prayer life, 
When he wants to point to the fact that your prayer life is boring, monotonous, and that you really don't know what to say, what we're really expressing is, I don't know the language. Jesus says, in John chapter 3, speaking to an aged teacher of Israel, someone that was acquainted with the fact that we had a father, but did not know who that father was. Jesus said to that man, if you want to enter heaven, you must be born again. And if you and I are born again, you, and, you start off like Anaya. You start off like Luke. There he is. Hey, Luke. Hey, Luke, well, I'm over here. This is Pastor Ariel. This is pa your cousin's holding you. Yeah, this is, hey, Luke. In two years, he'll look. Luke will look. But right now, he doesn't understand these words. But because his family talks words with him, he'll understand papa and mama. When you are born again, you and I are born to a different language, the language of God. That's why many people don't read their Bibles because like me, when I read it in Spanish, my mother tongue, I would read it and you would say, what did it say? I would say, I don't have a clue. It might as well be, have been written in Korean because I'm reading in Spanish and you ask me, do you understand? And it's a different language. It's the language of God. And I'm not saying Spanish is the language of God. The Bible was inspired. It is the revelation of who God is and the definition of that revelation. If God is my father, what does that mean? Jesus says, your father will continually tell you, do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. You will see circles under my eyes and Aline's eyes. Not because we're worrying, but because we're changing diapers in the middle of the night and feedings, and it's getting better. Praise the Lord. But you will not see white hairs or wrinkles or bags under Anaya's eyes. And it's not just because he's young. If you go to some orphanages or some places around the world, you will see children that are aging faster. But my little girl, if she could talk, right? If somehow we could press a button and Anaya is talking now at four months old, she may say something like this to you. I cry, and the moment I cry, someone is there with a bottle. I don't know how they do it, but it just happens. Whenever I cry, my mom turns me over, sniffs my rear end, and she knows she has to do something. And next thing I know, I'm getting a diaper change, and I was so uncomfortable. My skin was starting to itch, and now I'm comfortable again. These, these people are amazing. These things called pajamas, all of a sudden my toes were getting scrunched up. And guess what? They got me big pajamas. I'm comfortable again. I was in a small little bassinet that was kind of getting kind of tight, and now I'm in a crib that, man, you know, I'm, I'm like, like a, I have space, Yeah. I don't need to worry about milk or clothing. Somehow these individuals know I need these things, sometimes even before our cry, I cry. Can you say that about your Heavenly Father? Can you and I this morning say with the same confidence that Luke would say, I don't worry about life? You see them sleeping, they sleep in peace because they're not worrying. And you, Jesus says, why do you worry? Why do you worry? Don't you know you have a heavenly father? Revealing undefining words. In John chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, Jesus combines these two. 
He reveals we have a heavenly father and he defines. And in, in this process, Jesus points to us to the place where you and I need to begin if we want our prayer lives to extend beyond what we've made him out to be. And Jesus talks about that. If people, if we were to ask Jesus, what are these people praying about Jesus? Jesus would say, they're continually asking me to provide money for them. That's all they ever ask me for. Money to buy food, money to buy this, money to buy clothing, money to pay my bills. That's all they ask me. And prayer is not a shopping list. It's not a divine shopping list. That's not what prayer is. And that's why sometimes we are afraid to say prayer works because when we come to God, we come to him with a prayer list and God is too loving to sometimes give us the things we're praying for. Words. Words are not so that we can communicate and through the communication learn to manipulate. And we do that. It's called dysfunctional relationships. But the Bible is given to us as words so that through these words we can learn to communicate as we see who he is and in that develop a relationship based on love in which I no longer pray to get. I pray because I miss God. I like to talk with him. I made a note to myself as I was thinking about these things. If we want to define it in practical, tangible terms, yes, Anaya is my daughter. But in reality, she's not. Gianna will not become my daughter until she chooses to be my daughter. And her choosing someday to be my daughter is contingent upon my words with her my communication with her, and how this relationship develops. I'm talking to some of the parents that have kids a little bit ahead of us, and they've told us, yeah, we're getting into the stage where they're saying things like, Dad, can you drop me off three blocks from the school, please? Have you gone through that? Dad, can you, like, not stand so close to me, please? Not dress that way. Oh, Dad, did you have to say that joke? Oh. They don't want to be with Mom and Dad. Right now, my little girl, she clings to me, and I'm cherishing that. Because maybe, maybe, someday, she'll go through a stage where she doesn't want her daddy sitting next to her because she wants her friends. And that is a transition, a searching for identity. But if the relationship is there, she will choose to want to be my little girl. She will choose to say, that's my daddy. And I want to spend time with him. I want to talk with him. I want to tell him that there's situations and I have these feelings and I have these emotions and these things are happening in me. I want that relationship with my little girl. I don't want her to talk to me and tell me, I want new shoes, and that's all we talk about. I want a new dress. I want new hairstyle. I'm her daddy. I'm not her banker. And this relationship is being established day by day. This relationship, follow church, this relationship is established day by day through face-to-face -face communication, and this face-to-face -face communication, all of it depends upon the use of words. The more you expose your mind to the word of God, the more you will understand his language. And the more you understand the words of God and his language, the easier you will find to communicate things to God and the relationship will change. God is a person. We're not praying to thin air. God, prayer works. Prayers does things because we're not talking about psychology or self-help. We're talking about how to have a relationship with a God we do not see right now. That relationship is contingent, is founded upon words. Jesus said it. Luke, you know, John 17, 1 through 8 says, Jesus spoke these what, church? These words. Lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. 
as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you would have him. This very first two verses speaking about this glorifying, um, Father, glorify yourself as you glorify me. He's speaking about the cross, that old rugged cross. That old rugged cross in which the definition of God comes clearest. This is God. I have pictures of the lean at two in the morning holding Anaya because she's teething and can't fall asleep. I want to show those pictures of my wife sacrificing, my wife staying up till wee hours of the night, getting up early to make sure that Gianna has breakfast and trying to help me so that I have time for ministry and my brain is in the right place. I take pictures so that when Anaya ever questions whether mommy loves her, I'm going to show pictures to Anaya of a time where she did not even know mommy existed and show her this was mommy when you did not even know you had one. And the cross glorifies God because it shows that God loved us when we did not even care about him. That's our heavenly father. And if that's how he felt when we were enemies with him, how does he feel towards us now that we've accepted him as Lord and Savior? Do I have confidence in the love of my Father? That hinges, personally, that hinges on my engagement and learning the language of God. Verse 3, and this is eternal life. This is the crux of eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified, said Jesus. I have glorified you, Father, on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the man whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You, have, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them what, church? What has Jesus given to the human race? The words. I have given to them the words which you have given me. That, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you have sent me. Jesus is called the word of God. Because when we study his life, that life teaches us how to relate to God. It doesn't really simply say, you have a God in heaven, you have a Father in heaven. Well, if that Father in heaven is any, like, anything like my Father here on earth, because that's the only other Father that I know, a Father that abandons, a Father that's not there, a Father that overworks, a Father that prefers the Xbox over his children, if that's the kind of Father that is up there, then I'm better off without him in my life. But Jesus says he is not like that at all. He's not like that at all. And we get to know who God is by the words. You want your prayer life to improve, read more of the Bible. Don't spend so much time saying, well, maybe I need to pray more or I need to use certain words or read books about prayer. No, read books about your heavenly father. The more you understand your heavenly father, the more your prayers will have something that words cannot provide. Confidence. Confidence. I'm working sometimes pretty intense on several projects. But Gianna knows that she can come into my office and jump in my lap and say, Daddy, I'm thirsty. Or Daddy, here, I made this sticker for you with a smiley face. She has confidence that she can always come into my office because she's not walking into pastor's office. Where is she walking into? Where daddy's at. Where daddy's at. Our prayers suffer much when we are ignorant who we're praying to. Our prayers suffer much when we don't believe whom we are praying to. My mom about four or five years ago, we were visiting her in Pennsylvania. And she went into the house, the phone rang, and she was in there for quite some time. 
And I was outside with uh, Dalene. We, we didn't have children at that time. And my brother was there and my, my, cousin, my nieces and nephews. We were having a good time. And my mom comes out with the phone and she hands it to me. And she says, this is your prima, your cousin Claudia. She wants to talk with you. I haven't seen my cousin since 1981. We used to write letters to each other. But that stopped about 1986. So my cousin is on the other line. And I can't think of a single thing to talk to her about. You been there? It's Thanksgiving is that time or family gatherings at that time of awkward where you see that person that, what is his name again? And because of the absence of time, we don't know what to talk about. For many of us, some of the real reasons why we don't pray is because we don't know what to say. That person in the other line is a stranger. It's someone we don't know or someone we've forgotten who he is. But I had a choice. My mom said, here is your prima. Tell her I'm doing something. Now, I'm not telling you, Prima, I'm doing something. Talk to your cousin. <laughs> Hi. I didn't know what to talk to her about. Neither did she. So how's the weather? We always start there, right? How's the weather? That's when you know someone doesn't know what to say to you. Weather's nice. How's the weather over there? Nice, too. Oh, that's nice, 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 nice. How was the weather yesterday? We had a little rain, some clouds. You, oh, it was good. Oh, good, 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 good. Claudia, how do you feel? Oh, I'm not doing too good. The holidays are coming up, and I miss mom. My aunt passed away years ago for cancer. And the moment she said that, I don't feel too good because the holidays are coming up and it will remind me of mom's absence. The conversation changed. And I told her about us praying for a little girl. We didn't have one at that time. The, the, trying to find time for my family. You will be tempted to say, I don't even know where to begin. Like I was with my cousin Claudia. This morning, your pastor is saying, here, it's God. He wants to talk with you. It's God. He wants to talk with you. It's God. Hey, God's calling you. He wants to talk with you. Will you take this call? Like Claudia, I was like, I'm busy. Tell her I'm doing something. I'll call her later. My mom said, no. If you don't start a relationship now, when will you? When the relationship is good? If you don't start a relationship, when will the relationship ever get good? If you never seek to communicate, when will a relationship ever blossom? Because the equation is, here's relationships, but before there's a relationship, there's got to be communication. And before there's a communication, there has to be a foundation of words, a basis of vocabulary, a language. And even though I spoke Spanish, and even though my cousin spoke Spanish, we did not know each other anymore. When you and I are born again, we are confronted with that reality. Yes, you were born again, just like a baby is. And the first realization that ought to grip your heart is, I don't really know who God is. I don't know my father, but your father's calling you. Your father will call you tomorrow morning. Your father will call you for the rest of your life. Will you take his call? Will you hear his heart? Jesus says, stop praying about your clothes and your hair. Stop praying about your car and your house, about your relationships. Stop praying about those things. But seek first the kingdom of your father. Seek first the things that are important to your father. Get to know his righteousness. And you will only find that through the word. Does that make sense, church? Your father's calling you. Will you take that call? Your father's calling you. Will you take that call? Last Sabbath, 
I made an appeal about praying to intercede for each other, for the elders, the deacons, the deaconesses, Sabbath school teachers. Will you pray for the church? And then I made an appeal for the church. Will you pray? Just will you pray? This communication, words build communication, are useful, are essential for communication, and communication will lead to a relationship. We begin the year, and I want to ask you, church, will you take the call? How will you relate to this book this evening? I have a proposition for you. I have a, an appeal for you. I remember when I stopped writing letters to my cousin. I started learning English. And I started making friends in America. But I remember the first three years in this country, how I missed my abuela, my grandma. Oh, I missed her. I missed my cousins. We used to sleep over their house all the time. When I see you guys posting those pictures on Facebook, it brings so much memories. And I miss my cousins. They were so tight. But that relationship faded away when the communication decreased, when the exchange of words stopped. I remember the day we got the phone call that my abuela died. We couldn't leave the country. Man, we couldn't come back. My dad suffered a lot. And his own mother, he couldn't go to that funeral. A new year has begun. And you need to ask yourself, what has gotten in the, wor the way of the words? What has gotten in the way of the words? What has kept you so busy that you won't take God's call? So here's the appeal, unplug. During these 10 days of prayer and prior to it, unplug, unplug. You won't change unless you change something. And all we are asked to change is make room for my word. My mom said, you got to take this call. It's been years since you've talked to your cousin. And we talked for over an hour, over an hour. You are God's child. Many of us have grown up in church, this one or another church. Do you remember how you used to feel about God when you were little? Do you, still, do you remember the confidence you had when you prayed and the security you had in his love, where you wondered, why does Jesus have to tell grown-ups so much, do not worry? Now we know. <clears throat> what will you need to do to make space, make time for the words of God so that the words of God will reveal and define God to you so that when you pray, you won't focus so much on your words as in your heart. So are you willing to do this? Are you willing to take a fast from whatever it is, take a unplug of whatever it is? I'm, I'm asking specifically, church, because Last Sabbath, you know, we said, Happy New Year, Happy New Year. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, then you are new. Otherwise, it's just the same old, same old. I know what I have to unplug from, and I'm going to do it. I need more time with the Lord and his word. Is there anyone else that is willing to unplug whatever that might mean to you, for the specific purpose of spending time with God and his word. If you're willing, I want to invite you to join me up here.
if you're willing to unplug so that you're spending more time with God through his word, and you're willing to take this, I'm inviting you to come forward. Pastor, why do you ask us to come forward? Because when we are convicted of something and we feel that we need to do it, choosing to do something at that moment strengthens the decision to do it. That's why. It's not to make you uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to ask. <laughs> what if no one shows up? So I'm asking you for real. Your prayer life will never mature beyond your bills. Your prayer life will never go beyond when there's a crisis. That's no relationship at all. God wants you to love him as your father. And that relationship hinges on your time in God's word. Father in heaven, thank you that my mom was persistent in putting that phone in my hand. Over 20 decades that I had not spoken to my cousin. And after the few minutes of awkwardness, Lord, the love we used to have came back so strong. The longing for each other came back so strong. Father, some of us used to have a close walk with you a long time ago. And it has faded away. And it's because, Lord, relationships without communication cannot exist, cannot survive. Lord, honor, honor our feeble attempts. I, I want to see my church, Lord love to pray because they love you. Father, I pray for those of us that had come forward and those of us that are sitting. I pray for my entire church, Lord. Lead us, convict us, that your word, your, the Bible, has to take a central place in our lives. We need to read its pages. We need to get familiarized with that language and not feel frustrated. Lord, my little girl does not fling the bottle across the room because she doesn't understand what I'm saying to her. We ought not throw away your word simply because we don't get it. We will. We just need to hear it every day. We will learn to speak your language through your word. And when we do, our relationship will never be the same. Father, you, you know what I've been praying for my church. I pray that this morning. Give us a hunger. Give us a thirst for your word that will only be quenched when we act upon the desire you're putting in our hearts right now. And Father, I pray this in your name. You who love us, you have pity and compassion on us. It is in your name that I ask, in the name of your Son, Jesus, that I ask these things. Amen, Father.